Hi, I'm Michael Rosen and I'm sitting in my garden in North London and we're going to have a chat about poetry. And sometimes poetry can seem very difficult or maybe just something that you do at school. But actually, poetry is for everybody. Poetry is for all. People have been making up poems for thousands of years. And really, uh, you know, the songs that you listen to that are in the charts, they are in their own way poems as well. I mean, I don't want to name names, but you can think of some any songs that you listen to. And if you take the words away from the song for a moment and look at them on the page, that's a poem. You marry the poem to some music, and then of course that's a song. Now mostly I can't do that, I'm not very good at making up tunes, so I just write words. Sometimes people take those and put them to music. You could do the same thing. One of you could write the words, the other one write the music. Uh, that's, that's something that you could do in school or at home. Now, why do we do this? Well, we do it because sometimes we want to have fun, we want to celebrate, we want to dance, that's great. Sometimes bad things happen to us, sad things, and we want to find words to say it because we get troubled. Difficult things happen to us, things annoy us, we get angry as well. It's great to write about those things as well. If we're angry, we can put those into words and we can celebrate, we can do big grand things. And sometimes we just might want to look at something very small. You know what's just occurred to me? You see this bench that I'm sitting on? Do you know where it came from? My dad gave it to me. My dad gave it to me about 20, 30, I think maybe 40 years ago. So in a funny sort of way, you know what I'm doing? I'm sitting on my dad. I've just had that thought. And my dad, my dear dad, he died uh, well, 2008. So here's a way of remembering my dad. So I could actually, and I, and I want to remember my dad, because he really mattered to me, you know, he, he, he helped me in lots of ways. I sometimes think of my dad as a map. You know, he showed me here, there. In fact, I once wrote a poem, my dad is a map. Because you can do that in poetry. That's like, we call that a metaphor, don't we? It isn't really a map. But in poems, you can say that, my dad is a map. But I've just this second had another thought. My dad is a bench. You see, my dad is a bench. I sit on him. That's just the beginning of a poem I haven't made up yet. I've just thought it while I'm sitting here now. My dad is a bench. Yeah, and this bit here, the arm fell off and I had to put it back again. Well, that's beginning to be a metaphor as well, isn't it? That the bench got a bit rickety, like he did, you see? So I had to mend it. Well, some things went wrong with my dad and he had to be mended. So I've now got another metaphor going. My dad's a bench and the arm fell. You see, I'm beginning to build up an image and a picture. Now, something big happened to me in 2020. I nearly died. I had to go to hospital because I got COVID and they put me in a coma. I don't really know what that is. That's basically they make you unconscious in order for your body to try and get better. So I was in a coma, unconscious, for 40 days. And I don't know anything about this. It's completely mysterious. What, what, what was it? The nurses who looked after me, and this is the incredible thing about the NHS, these people, complete strangers, looked after me. And I was in a coma, and I was in a coma during my birthday. On May the 7th, my birthday. And they wrote me a little note saying, happy birthday. And we sat round your bed and we sang you happy birthday. I don't remember it. And I read that and I'm really moved about it. And I kind of want to write about all these things because I get so upset thinking about it. So what I'm going to do is read you some poems from my new book, which is called Many Different Kinds of Love. And that's what happened, really. I found out the love of my wife, the love of my kids, the love of a wider family, friends, people writing to me saying, we, you know, we're so glad you're getting better. And then the love really of the care of the nurses and the doctors. And so that's what I wrote about in this book, Many Different Kinds of Love. And I'm gonna read you some bits from it, right from the time when I started getting ill. And as I read them to you, I hope you're gonna get some ideas of things that you could write. 
These were, these were the special difficult things that I was in. But of course, we all have difficulties, we all have fun moments, so you might be able to think of those. So here's me being ill. Day 12. The year's seasons roll by in a night. Sweats, freezes, sweats, freezes. Wondered whose mouth I had. I, I didn't remember it as made of sandpaper. Water is as good as ever. Now, some of you may like poems that rhyme. I like poems that rhyme as well. But if you don't rhyme, you can make other ways of sticking words together. What did I do there? I said, sweats, freezes, sweats, freezes. So that's what we call repetition. The moment you repeat things, you make a rhythm. My name's Michael Rosen. Michael Rosen, Michael Rosen, Michael Rosen. Da 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 You take your name, whatever your name is, repeat it five times and you'll have a rhythm. You see? So I took sweats, freezes, sweats, freezes. And then I did something else. I did that thing you can do in poems, which is not tell the truth. The year's seasons roll by in a night. Yeah, well, they don't, do they? But I've said they do, because you can do that in poems in order to show how extreme something is. And that's got a special word. It's called hyperbole. That means exaggerating in order to make it really kind of affect you. Yeah, there's a very famous poem that you might look at about a man during the First World War. And uh, his name is Wilfred Owen. And he wrote a poem that begins, bent double like old beggars. Well, they weren't really bent double, were they? And they weren't, all right, they were a bit like old beggars, but were they really? But that really affects you because you see that and you think bent double like old beggars. And then you picture these young men in the First World War like that. So I've done something similar, you see. And then I've said, wondered whose mouth I had. Did I really? Now, I knew it was my mouth, but that's a way of showing that it was a strange feeling. But I didn't say, what a strange feeling in my mouth. I said, wondered whose mouth I had. And then I say, I didn't remember it as made of sandpaper. It's another fib, really, but I'm trying to convey the feeling, yeah? And then, with a very direct statement, I say, water is as good as ever. And now I brought that right the way down to something very ordinary. And there's another word for that as well. That's called bathos. So what I've done is I've gone from hyperbole to bathos with some rhythm in the middle. And that's only whatever it is, just a few words, maybe 30 words. And I've done that in that poem. Now you can steal all those ideas from me. Please do. Hyperbole to make a moment really feel rhythm, and then bathos, yeah? So that's where I was when I was getting ill, yeah? And then we sometimes have very dramatic moments that happen in our lives. And I can't think of a more dramatic moment than when I was taken into the hospital and a man is telling me, a doctor, is that I've got to go on a ventilator. So that's a special thing where they have to put a tube into you and a lot of other stuff, yeah? So I remember the conversation, it went like this. A doctor is standing by my bed, asking me if I would sign a piece of paper which would allow them to put me to sleep and pump air into my lungs. Will I wake up, I say? There's a 50-50 chance. If I say no, I say, zero, and I sign. So that's what you might call very bald. In other words, it's, it's, no, it's no frilly bits. It's, it's, not, it's not got descriptions in it. I'm saying what the doctor's looking like. I'm not saying what I look like. So what have I done there? What I've done is tell a story very, very simply. We've got a word for that. We call that an anecdote. You can always write an anecdote. You, you don't have to call it a poem, really. I do. I, I, I like the idea of just putting it there chopping it up into little lines so it's easy to read. But these little anecdotes, they help us sort out something, what, an, what happened in that dramatic moment. And I've also left out, you know, what people look like or what I was feeling. So I'm leaving that for the reader. I'm leaving gaps, obvious word to use if you like, leaving gaps 
for you, the reader, to figure out how dramatic a moment that was for me. That's life and death, isn't it? I've got a 50-50 chance of waking up. And that's what it was, because they put me in a coma. They didn't know if I would wake up or not. It was like I'd sort of been dead, and then one day I woke up 40 days later. And this made me think of something else. And I want to see if you can steal this idea from me as well. There's all these stories that you know, films, songs, uh, any, anything at all, TV programs, they're all for us to use. We can steal these stories. I've stolen here a story, an ancient Greek story, about a man called Odysseus who goes to the land of the dead. I'm a traveller who reached the land of the dead. I broke the rule that said I had to stay. I crossed back over the water. I dodged the guard dog. I came out. I've returned. I wander about. I left some things down there. It took bits of me as prisoner, an ear and an eye. They're waiting for me to come back. The ear is listening. The eye is the lookout. So why have I talked about the ear and the eye? Because I can't really see with that eye. I can't really hear with that ear. When I went into the coma, I was perfectly all right. It didn't have that problem. And COVID took away my hearing and my sight. So I've used a story to tell my story. So that's another great way of writing. You take a story and use it to tell your story. And that's what we call using myth. Yeah. So there's another idea. And then I'm going to finish with a poem that, um, well, this poem went on telly. All right. And this is a poem about what I think about the NHS. These are the hands that touch us first. Feel your head, find the pulse, and make your bed. These are the hands that tap your back, test the skin, hold your arm, wheel the bin, change the bulb, fix the drip, pour the jug, replace your hip. These are the hands that fill the bath, mop the floor, flick the switch, soothe the sore, burn the swabs, give us a jab, throw out sharps, design the lab. And these are the hands that stop the leaks, empty the pan, wipe the pipes, carry the can, clamp the veins, make the cast, log the dose, and touch us last. So that's a story that's hidden behind what I'm saying, the story of life to death, and also a tribute to all those incredible people who work in the NHS. Please feel free to steal that. You could talk about hands or you could talk about feet. These are the feet that walk the floor, something like anything. This is the head that, you know, you could talk about eyes. These are the eyes or these are the ears, anything like that. You could use that in order to tell a story and you could rhyme it like I did. It's got a bit of a rhythm to it as well. Uh, so there's an idea. I wanted to pay tribute. You could pay tribute to people who've helped you in your life. I mean, in a way, bus drivers, refuse collectors, they all help us. You could write a poem about that or about the people in your family who've helped you, your nan, your granddad, and you could describe it. You could say, these are the eyes. And you could be about all the eyes in your family, couldn't it? So please, steal any of the ideas that I've given you today. Thanks very much.